Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Four Consulting and Discussion With. I'm absolutely delighted and honored that we have uh, the German State Secretary for, uh, from the Finance Ministry in Germany, Jörg Kukus, with us. It's an extremely busy time for him and with the German presidency, many other things going on around COVID. So it's a real honor that you've taken the time to speak to me this morning. Um, we've got a very large attendance, uh, which won't surprise you, Jörg. Um, one of the largest, I think the largest we've ever had in our series, and this is now the 13th event, so uh, that's a reflection of the interest in this. I think with that maybe I start um, in asking you about banking union. Um, you were co-chairing the um, EFC working group um, around this last year, which led to this report in summer last year. Now you're in charge of kind of taking banking union forward under the presidency. Um, what's your vision? What's your expectations? What's your visions around banking union? Well, I think it's obvious that priorities shifted um, um, a little bit because obviously in the last six months, uh, crisis management uh, with respect to the fiscal policies and the recovery instruments and all of the uh, response to the crisis were certainly at the forefront and uh, took center stage and I think that was uh, the obvious and right decision but we're um, since the start of our presidency we're launching right into the discussion on the um, what we called the holistic approach namely to discuss all elements of the banking union namely crisis management all of the cross-border um, um, home host issues um, um, the introduction of a deposit insurance further safeguards for host countries, um, <clears throat> further risk reduction, um, all elements basically are in, the, um, are in the mix at the moment. And we have a very intensive debates, both at technical and political level. Um, so uh, I think we're making, we're making good progress. And the commission has announced several um, initiatives um, on the legislative um, front. So this thing is progressing and we're committed to uh, moving it forward. You're right. I should have maybe started with COVID uh, rather than just jumping straight into banking union. Oh. But but to you know, to what extent, if you look at financial services regulation, is COVID impacting the thinking around the banking union discussion? And to what extent we had a session earlier this week, is COVID also impacting you know the banking prudential framework, the work around Basel, the expectations about how the banking system has you know managed to handle itself in the crisis and how we respond to the crisis kind of in, in the prospect of possible rises of NPLs? Well, I think the, the um, response um, that we had to the crisis, given that it wasn't only fiscal, but uh, also had a lot of elements of, um, of uh, reaction to the transmission channel of bank credits to the real economy, um, really showed the importance of the topic of banking union and strong banks. I mean, the fact that, uh, um, as I mean, it's almost sort of a, a standard quote now um, that banks were part of the solution, not part of the problem in the in the crisis response so far, um, and that goes for many aspects, right? I mean, um, if you if you think about it, there haven't been many recessions um, in history where um, credit provision to the real economy actually expanded substantially, and that's exactly what we've seen in Q2 and Q3. Um, and I think that has um, several elements, um, the most important of which is the strength and capital base of, uh, of European banks um, and global, global banks for that matter, and that have allowed the banks to be resilient in this crisis. The second is certainly the fact that uh, Europe um, acted very uniformly and that, um, that uh, in many, many member states, guarantee programs for lending were installed. Um, Germany um, was very quick um, with our KFW program, but uh, France, Italy, Spain, many other countries um, also um, installed programs like that that allowed um, the volume of credits to continue to uh, to stay solid and even expand. And we installed a, uh, a guarantee program also through the EIB, which is taking a bit long to install, but it's getting it's getting there and will pick up uh, the pace in, um, in um, later this year and early next year. So that has really helped. And I think what also helped is that uh, that we responded at the prudential level. I mean, the um, so-called CRR quick fix <clears throat> um, and uh, some of the measures announced very quickly into the crisis by the SSM <clears throat> cutting into uh, buffers, um, um, reducing counter using counter cyclical buffers exactly for what they're intended, namely to give relief in times of crisis, 
um, a lot of the relaxations and the modifications of the IFRS regime um, to, to slow down um, movement to stage two, stage three. All of these um, responses, I think, gave um, a combination of relief to the banking sector and incentives to the banking sector to continue provision of credit to the real economy. And I'm absolutely convinced that, uh, that those um, measures have, together with what the ECB has done on the monetary policy side, um, really helped for the, um, for, the, for the macro reaction that we've seen, namely better provision of credit to a crisis economy. I can't agree more with that. I think it's been remarkable how the banking sector has stood up to the crisis. And also, as you say, both within the EU, but also internationally, the, the consistency of the response, both on the fiscal side, on the monetary side, and on the prudential side, has been really quite remarkable. But, you know, initially we thought during the German presidency we would get a proposal on the CRD6, CRR3, so the final pieces of the Basel implementation. Obviously, that's been moved back in the light of the COVID crisis. And maybe it's a bit too early, but have you drawn some conclusions already as to what COVID might mean for the Basel framework, so something beyond temporary quick fixes, certain elements that might be worth reviewing, reassessing uh, in the Basel context? The crisis has the most immediate impact, obviously, in just simply time delay, right? So I think it was the absolutely correct decision, um, given uh, the restrictions on work um, at the Commission and the prior reprioritization and the massive effort that it takes to um, to get this uh, biggest uh, relief package in history on the road with the um, next generation EU and simultaneously the um, the um, MFF, I think it was the very correct response um, um, to delay the proposal for for Basel, um, and uh, it looks like uh, we'll we'll uh, see the, the the first indication sometime um, early next year. So I think that's. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're not implementing truthfully and faithfully, it just means the delay. In terms of content, I think it's it's going to be the similar issues that we had before the crisis, um, um, namely how do we square adherence to the principles that we agreed in the Basel Agreement um, with the, um, the well-known um, um, resolutions, both of the ECOFIN and the G20, namely to avoid significant capital increases that would be a hindrance to provision of credit to the real economy. I think that's the balancing act that we'll have. Um, as has become known now publicly, um, um, my uh, friend and colleague uh, Odile Renaud Basso and I um, sent a letter to the Commission with some proposals that we made, um, that we've by now made public, um, that are, um, I think, um, a quite pragmatic but yet truthful implementation of the output floor that um, have some ideas on how we can deal with uh, issues surrounding the implementation um, of the rules regarding non-rated corporates um, and squaring that with the fact that in Europe um, more com companies are non-rated than in other parts of the world. And last but not least, a um, very important um, um, push towards more proportionality and relief for non-systemic banks. I think those are the three pillars that uh, we agreed with France and proposed to the Commission, and of course now it's the Commission's job to uh, decide whether to implement those uh, proposals that uh, Germany and France have made or not. No, thank you very much. Maybe two last questions on, on Basel before we may move over, or prudential rules, before we move over to the CMU questions. I think one is, the, in, in the context, not the latter, uh, but more broadly around European specificities and, and the nature that we have over 6,000 banks, many of them very small. And in Europe, we've taken the luxury of implementing Basel across the board, while in other jurisdictions, it's focused on some of the larger banks. So how do you square this debate around European specificities and the European tailored regime and the need for international consistency in the level playing field? Yeah, I think that's that's always the the, the balancing act that we have with colleagues in, um, you know, when we discuss in the and financial stability board, for example, at the global level on how we actually um, square the adherence to the Basel principles with uh, taking it to, into account the needs of the regional economies with their specifics. And I think in Europe, it's all about proportionality. We just have a, a different organization, a less concentrated banking sector, um, that uh, and, 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 a, and a real issue that uh, that the U.S. has solved um, by exempting a large number of banks, um, especially the non-systemic ones, 
Europe so far is going down a different path. But um, you know, the banking package that we're just implementing um, also shows that uh, proportionality is a strong um, is, has a strong case in um, in Europe as well. Um, we're just in the final stages of implementing the banking package into German law and are, for example, um, giving quite a lot of relief to banks with balance sheets less than 5 billion euros um, on reporting, um, on banks below 15 billion, on, um, on, uh, on compensation rules, because they usually don't pay bonuses, so they don't uh, need to fulfill all of the rules and regulations of these systemic banks that do pay bonuses. So in that sense, you know, we're trying to, to be as specific as we can and use the discretion that we have um, at the European level um, to implement nationally. And I think that's perfectly reasonable um, and, a, and a very good and established practice in Europe. Thank you. And maybe closing, we had a very interesting conversation with a colleague uh, from Japan on Tuesday on this, and that was about the exit strategy. And maybe it's far too early to talk about exit. We're just in the middle of the or beginning of a second wave from COVID. But at some stage, um, you know, different. Even though we had a consistent way internationally of responding to the crisis, it's possible that different regions exit the economic crisis at a different time or a different speed. Look at China at the moment compared to where we are in Europe or the US. Um, it's maybe too early, but have, have there been any thoughts, has there been any discussions as to how to ensure some form of consistency of exiting the crisis? Because otherwise, this be it the state aid regime, be it the prudential framework, be it the monetary policy, could have significant disturbing effects to global trade and uh, global markets. Yeah, but I think we have to remain flexible, right? I mean, who would have, <clears throat> in, when, when we saw the, the first indication of relief um, of uh, declining numbers after the lockdowns in spring, um, we saw much improved numbers in the summer. Who would have thought that we're going into different stages of, uh, <clears throat> of lockdowns um, in, across Europe um, um, in November, right? So in that sense, I think it's way too early to, to have thoughts about abolishing programs. Um, I think we have to design the programs such that they will allow a, an exit. And uh, when we think about, for example, recapitalization measures or state guaranteed lending to corporates, um, we structure the, um, the, um, the entry of the government into the capital structure of the corporates in a way that sort of coerces us to um, exit if and when um, the, the market funding is available again, but we consciously don't uh, don't make any um, firm decisions. I you have to exit by July the first, two thousand twenty-one, because you know who knows um, how quickly we the the current lockdowns will lead to sustainable results in terms of reducing the numbers of the pandemic. Um, and the effort that's being made right now, I think, is a very reasonable one, i.e. reducing social contacts to the extent possible while maintaining um, the economics um, and uh, the economically essential and socially essential access to schooling, um, um, childcare and uh, work. Um, uh, hopefully that, that will function, but who knows whether it will function. And if it doesn't function, then then everyone knows that uh, that we will have to reassess and of course all of this will have economic impact and so the, i think uh, it, the, all of those um those realities of of the fight against the pandemic um clearly demonstrate that it's uh, at the moment um our issue is much more um more of an entry into additional programs um i .e. we're thinking at the moment about how to structure a 10 billion relief program to all of the um um, um, all of the companies um, or activities that were shutting down, namely restaurants, hotels, um, um, cultural um, venues, um, um, and all of the um, all of the shutdown um, affected um, um, companies and um, and institutions. So, so at the moment, you know, we're more into the additional entry mode than the exit mode at the moment. Good. Th thank you very much indeed. I think in a way that kind of brings us quite neatly in, into Capital Markets Union, one of the other priorities on which finance ministers will uh, speak uh, and, and have a discussion in December. Um, the views in council, at least as far as the timing, not the content, but the timing and ambitions of some of the measures are concerned is a bit different to what the Commission envisaged in its uh, kind of initial papers around this. And, um, where do you see, uh, let's start with this. 
How important is CMU? This is CMU 2. There's been a bit of cynicism about CMU 1, a lot of legislative measures, fairly little tangible immediate impact. So, so how do you see the future of CMU and how important is it? First of all, I don't get the cynicism, right? I mean, um, if you if you look at the history of CMU, um, <clears throat> I still remember one of my first guests uh, after taking office in uh, 2018 was Lord Hill, and he expressed his frustration to me that um, of the um, of the um, 19 uh, proposals that he made, only three were implemented between 2015 and 2018. Uh, but I told them, I told them at, at that time already that Germany and France are making a very, very big effort to revive the debate around CMU. Um, in June 2018, um, President Macron um, and, um, and Chancellor Merkel, um, Finance Ministers Scholz and Le Maire made a very, very far-reaching agreement in the Meseback um, paper. And one of the key components was a joint Franco-German um, effort to revive exactly the, the missing CMU legislative acts. And uh, we, we managed um, in the period from, uh, from summer 18 until the end of the legislature of the last European Parliament um, just in just over a year um, to, to push through 11 legislative proposals. Um, of course, all of those are now being implemented into national legislation. We're just getting the benchmark regulation done, the CCP rules done, all of the ISA reviews are implemented right now. Um, so, so all of this is happening as we speak, right? So in that sense, I, I would counter the cynicism. Um, yes, CMU is not like um, next generation EU, where um, you know um, there's a huge negotiation around a budget. And after four nights and four days of negotiation, a 750 billion package is announced or it's not announced. In this case, it was success, successfully negotiated. CMU by nature is just much more broad and much more uh, particular because it consists by definition of many individual legislative acts that are as um, um, technical as benchmark regulations and CCP regulations that never will um, reach the, um, the, the, the headline um, catching um, um, attention as the um, next generation EU, but are extremely important. And the fact that, um, you know, the commission just published 120 pages of extremely precise um, um, work by the, um, by the um, high level um, forum that was installed to bring forward the CMU with 17 groups of proposals that we're now um, going through in our presidency, prioritizing them, discussing them with member states, um, with the goal of getting council conclusions agreed by December so that the commission has a very, very clear path and very clear support from the member states when it enters into the implementation of all of those ideas into actual legislation um, um, in, um, starting in, uh, in late 20, early 21. So all of those things are moving forward. The commission is fully committed. Um, we have sister projects going on um, that are extremely strategic with the digital union. Um, <clears throat> if you read Mika, the markets in crypto assets, if you read the payment strategy, if you read the digital finance strategy that the commission has, if you read um, um, cyber resilience uh, proposals that the commission has made, um, th these are also massively important sister projects to the CMU. So I think we're, we're really getting into ambition levels that, uh, that, uh, that uh, will make CMU a reality and that will make the payment systems that are crucial to support the CMU also a strategic reality. No, you are right. I think, and, and forgive me when I said a cynicism, it, it, there's a lot no, happening. It's real. It's real. It's, uh, it's a realistic depiction of some of public perceptions. So, But, but okay. you're right. I think the number of initiatives that we're anticipating over the next two to three years I think is unprecedented, I, at least since I've been in Brussels, just the number of initiatives yeah. and legislation. And I think also um, talking about sister projects, you know, like one of the key controversies um, that we had over the last years was always the lack of a European um, euro denominated safe asset. Um, there was huge debate and a massive controversy. Um, and without really any debate around European safe asset, all of a sudden the uh, commission um, issues um, 230 billion demand um, meeting um, 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 paper um, that, uh, that, has, uh, that has the highest rating category that uh, trades in a 
um, spread level that you can certainly categorize as safe asset worthy. Um, so in that sense, one of the key controversies of the banking union and the capital markets union discussion um, has essentially been solved by the package that we now have. And that will, even though the package is, um, is a one-off package, it exists until 2058. So until 2058, we will have massive billions and billions and billions of euros of um, safe assets denominated in euro um, for the first time in history in that kind of volume. So it brings forward a lot of the CMU and banking union debates as well. Yeah, I th thank you for saying that. Our very first event that we did was exactly on this, the link between in the next generation in EU and CMU. And, and I think the only conclusion was it's a really good start, but ideally it would need to be maintained, you know, to, to be a safe asset, a permanent safe asset. We would need further issuances somewhere down the line. But I know that's a controversial issue and I leave that to the side, but purely from a, a safe asset strategic perspective. But it's not, I, I, I would, to be perfectly honest, I disagree with that because it is agreed, right? Because the, the next generation EU will run until 2058. So in that sense, even though the even if the even if we never ever ever do a, anything like a next generation EU again, um, and there is no commitment to doing it, right? So it would be wrong to to claim that. But the fact that it's a revolving and recurring uh, facility that will last for decades and decades um, will make sure that there's issuance and reissuance and maturing and reissuance of mature debt for a very, very long time. So in that sense, um, you know, the, 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 yes, it will melt down because of course the debt gets paid back. So the volumes will, will go down, which of course others would like to see it go up, but you know, who knows what other ideas will come up with in the next decades. And in the next decade, there will be a large volume of debt issuance coming forward. And what I also think is extremely important for the CMU debate and for the banking union debate is the so far, um, I would say, underappreciated part of the um, head of state and government leaders um, <clears throat> agreement to bring forward the introduction of own resources for the European Union. I think that um, in terms of um, growing of a fiscal union, which is always a important corollary to banking and capital markets union, it's massive, right? I mean, if the European Union agrees on new own resources, which the heads of state and government have agreed and they've agreed on a roadmap and specifics of which taxes um, and uh, will be introduced as own resources for the EU that will have a massively positive um, um, uh, impact on fiscal union, on banking union, on capital markets union. Um, because, you know, if, whether you look at Australia, the United States, Switzerland or any federation, loose federation that turned into something more central, um, unifying taxes is always a huge element of that. Thank you. I think I've got three more questions on CMU. I think the first one is on prioritization. You made the point. The Commission at the moment hasn't really given a clear, a very clear prioritization, I feel. The Council is going in a slightly different direction. I think you're trying to give a, a clearer steer as to which of the proposed measures should be tackled first. Maybe you could comment a little bit as to what you think are the, the low-hanging fruit or the most urgent measures out of the CMU action plan that you think should be tackled first? Yeah, I think there's a, there is a very strong um, um, set of um, proposals that, that uh, sort of lend themselves to being uh, done early. You know, like unifying reporting standards, I think is something that, uh, that should get done very quickly. And we've made some progress, but, uh, but the commission made some good proposals on that. Incentivizing long-term investing, I think is something that, you know, whether I talk to insurance companies, pension funds in Northern, Central, Western, Eastern, no matter where in Europe, they all are about the same thing, namely extracting maturity um, premium and extracting a liquidity premium, because those are the um, very few premia that are still around. <clears throat> so setting a European framework, incentivizing long-term um, sustainable investing by institutions, I think is something that is, uh, that is a very clear goal that we'll have. And of course, in the Solvency II review that is upcoming anyways, um, that's a very good, um, um, method to, um, to, to achieve that. I think <clears throat> we will also see that through the increased um, debt levels of corporate of the corporate sector during this crisis will obviously in the second round lead to a very natural um, rebalancing of balance sheet uh, requirement that will require equity. And so I think um, a European initiative 
um, how we can um, get, uh, get markets to provide more equity finance um, across the board in Europe, specifically to small and medium companies, I think is another one of these um, ideas that the Commission has that I think is extremely valuable. Um, and that we will look to move forward as well. So I think, um, you know, but that's, that's just a subset. And uh, um, we, um, we have um, very advanced discussions on council conclusions um, that will give more of a prioritization, but those are still being negotiated. So I would like to um, maintain my promise um, of presidential confidentiality on that specific. Neutrality. I fully understand. You covered actually the equity point as well, because that was my next point that, you know, COVID led to a massive rise in debt, uh, debt instruments, uh, and we always talked about rebalancing debt and equity in Europe. And, and yep. so it's good to hear about the importance of equity, which then brings me to a question which also came from Tangi, uh, from a farmer, which is one of the most controversial issues, and you mentioned the ESA review already, is the question about strengthening or whether to strengthen the supervisory authorities even further as part of CMU. I know that's also linked a little bit to the anti-money laundering debate and the broader wire card debate. Um, but given that the ESA review was only implemented at the beginning of the year and it was not the easiest file to negotiate and very much reflects some of the dynamics in council between home and host states, which you see in the banking union and other issues, what role do you see within the CMU context or the wider context for further strengthening of the European supervisory authorities over the next short term uh, years? Yeah. You know, Germany surprised quite a few um, because we did have a, um, a um, not insignificant shift in our position uh, on, um, on this topic. And I think the, the Meseback um, agreement with France reflected that because we also made it very clear that we do need to see um, strengthening of European supervisory um, institutions um, and uh, we did what we can to support that then also during the ISA review. Of course, it's always a controversial topic, um, but, uh, but uh, I do think we made some progress. Um, and, um, you know, since you addressed Wirecard, um, one, of the, um, one of our lessons learned um, from the Wirecard scandal, and that's now government opinion, um, is that we do want to strengthen particularly market supervisory powers of European um, institutions. Um, and we want to look at best practices in the U.S. Um, and, um, and, um, and uh, other regions of the world to see how um, market supervision at the central level can, um, can help avoid some of the um, problems that we had. So in that sense, I think we're all in line that we need further strengthening. Of course, um, you know, it's a sensitive topic because those who are critical about moving more supervisory power to the European level have, have the standard argument, we've just had a review, no more review reviews um, but um, you know others argue you know we're always in review mode right so we always have to advance and given that reforms take very long to implement in Europe I don't think anyone can prohibit a discussion around further harmonization and you mentioned the AML topic um, you know the establishment of a European AML authority um, is something that uh, we as presidency can find um, both we support wholeheartedly and when we're discuss discussing the forthcoming and council conclusions on AML, we see huge support um, um, in favor of A, moving from D to R, namely from directive to regulation to harmonize AML rules across Europe, um, and second, um, to establish a European authority on, uh, on AML. So I think it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that, is, that, that is moving ahead. Um, some will always say that it's too slow, but we're definitely making progress and will continue to address this issue of supervisory harmonization in a very uh, forward-looking manner. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, allow me to move a little bit to sustainable finance, the other big issue um, on your agenda. I think it's interesting to see that Germany issued the Green Bund recently. I think that was a big success. Maybe you want to say a few words about that. But also um, your vision around sustainable finance. Um, the action plan will only come out after the German presidency, which is good because maybe you can speak more freely about it as a result. But how do you set a sustainable finance into the framework of CMU and the wider objectives of the European Union? It, it has moved center stage, right? I mean, if you look at the amount of demand for ESG paper, um, I mean, the commission with its social bonds just uh, gave a, a huge demonstration of, uh, of the viability of the concept. Um, when, it's interesting because when we 
had our debate around um, issuing our first ESG bond. Um, all investors told us there's only one topic that interests investors at the moment, and, and that's the E in ESG. Um, and just a few months afterwards, you know, the, the European Commission generates uh, 230 billion of demand for an S uh, in ESG bond, um, namely a social bond. So I think uh, I think it just shows the speed um, at which this topic is getting um, to the middle um, and the mainstream of investing. So I think that's 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 probably the most important um, insight that we've uh, that we've been able to have. Um, and given the large demand that we had for our first uh, 10-year um, Green Bund, um, we will continue with a five-year um, Green Bund um, as we announced in the course of November, and that's pretty soon. So in that sense, I think uh, um, you know, this topic will, will gain center stage very, very quickly um, um, and continue. I think what's extremely important now is that we move forward on the, um, on the level two on the taxonomy. Um, we had a very difficult, but at the end, fruitful and constructive decision and uh, decision-making process on, um, on the level one. Um, we are agreed now, it's done, um, and now it's extremely important that we get a pragmatic and workable solution on, uh, on level two so that uh, the capital markets actually use the taxonomy broadly. I think that's extremely important um, that, that we get channel finance to transition um, um, in, um, investments that move that allow our economy to move those sectors that are still uh, that are still heavy consumers um, of, of of energy and uh, uh, that have large car carbon footprints to deploy the capital and to get the capital at reasonable um, financing levels to allow them to shift um, to carbon neutrality and uh, many sectors um, of our industry, namely steel. Um, namely automotive, are being incentivized massively by our fiscal programs to go down exactly that route. So I think, uh, I think the greening of the economy is actually move, move, being moved forward quite substantially by the current crisis in a positive way. Uh, one area that's under discussion, and the question came in from Stefan Marx of Deutsche Bank on that, is around the prudential weightings. So uh, not jumping all the way back to the uh, beginning of our discussion, but the trade-off between creating incentives in the prudential framework, green supporting factors, for example, and balancing that with risk, and balancing that with the long-term availability of data around you know, the risks in, in the environment. But as you say, in the whole ESG space, we yesterday had an event specifically on the social dimension, actually. Um, what, what's your feeling about that balance between the risk elements which the supervisors are concerned about and the incentivization that might come through uh, more favorable risk weightings in this area. Yeah, I, I'm very skeptical on <clears throat> trying to politicize pr the prudential world. And I think uh, green supporting factors to me are, are, you know, supporting factors can work if and only if there is hard empirical evidence that there is less risk in certain activities. And so far, nobody has demonstrated that um, you know wind farms, solar farms, um, and um, hydrogen are non-risky economic activities. In fact, they're very risky, and I wouldn't say they're more risky necessarily than others. But there is economic risk in financing um, renewable energy projects, right? And that's normal. That's natural. It, it would be um, it would be awkward if there weren't. Um, and I think as long as the, there is no evidence that there is less risk in renewable energy projects than in um, standard ones, um, I don't see a, a, a real convincing argument for prudential um, relief. Um, if we incentivize massive overinvestment only by giving prudential relief, um, that could create bubbles and uh, those would be, I would say, counterproductive in the long run. So in that sense, um, you know, we're looking at this. It's not like we're saying never, um, never ever. If someone um, proves to us, or if there is um, there is consistent empirical evidence um, that um, that uh, for whatever reasons there's less risk, um, you know, we're happy to look at the hard data. But so far, we haven't seen hard data that's compelling evidence to re to move forward on um, green supporting factors. Actually, a good question came in there just now, linking to this, Jörg, which is. Um, yeah, the, the question around incentivization. I think the green bond point, I think, is well taken. And congratulations on that. And also Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said 
the significant part of the uh, in, in the next generation EU will be financed through green bonds and that will kind of strengthen that market in Europe, maybe make Europe or should make Europe the market leader in green bonds. So on the capital raising side, I think a, a very fascinating set of developments. But if we look at from a perspective of a corporate, not a financial institution, but a corporate, the incentives there to, to manage the transition. How do we manage that? We will have a, a proposal on non-financial reporting. We have increasing obligations on corporates to provide data. Uh, all of that's on top of their, their current challenges of, of maintaining economic activities, retaining international competitiveness. So how do we feed in that incentivization at the, t at the tail end, meaning outside the financial markets in the, in the corporate environment? Yeah. Yeah, I wish uh, I, I have a, a very big session this afternoon with uh, my um, colleagues in the um, environmental ministry together with the German um, Sustainable Finance um, Committee um, with the corporate sector addressing exactly this question. Um, so, um, you know, I could tell you more in a few hours, but uh, but I think it's important to have practicable um, um, rules for the corporate sector on financial disclosure and uh, transparency. I, I think the, the, the insight is gaining momentum that it's better for the corporate sector to have one set of rules to abide by <clears throat> rather than having 25, 30 or 40 rules by each large institutional investor. Because I think if the EU doesn't um, agree on on um, disclosure of, um, of sustain, sustainability risks and environmental risks, um, each investor of any size will, will demand reporting and um, it will be much easier for the corporate sector to have a standardized set of rules to, um, to report to. That's much more scalable in terms of resources investing in, invested into the reporting mechanism um, than if they um, have to adhere to, um, you know, investor A, B, C, D, E, F, G um, um, individual reporting requirements. And all investors that we talk to are telling us exactly that. They're waiting for the EU um, to establish a standard. If that's a good standard, they will just accept that. <clears throat> if, if it's not, if the, if the standard doesn't exist or if it's not a good standard, then they will all um, demand their own standards and that will be much more complicated for corporates to adhere to than if there's one um, uniform efficient set. Thank you. Yes, and maybe with an element of proportionality, because you're right, at the moment there's over 150 different standards out yeah. there, and, and at a minimum it's forum shopping, and at worst it's, as you say, multiple reporting requirements by the same corporate. There's a number of questions that came in, which I would call are, are slightly broader, and I would like to bring those together at the end for the last five minutes. But maybe for five minutes we could just move to the digital agenda. You already mentioned Mika, crypto assets. There are two legislative files, actually important legislative files, that uh, your colleagues in the ministry are actually dealing with at the moment in, in working groups on crypto assets, on which we already had a discussion, and on DORA, Operational Resilience, where we had a separate session. I know you're very keen on, on this issue of digitalization of financial services. And maybe you would like to say a little bit around where you see that agenda moving um, and how it might impact the regulatory and policy debates around financial services. Yeah, <clears throat> so first of all, I think it's a huge opportunity for Europe, right? I think what, what is underestimated is how powerful our digital payment systems are at the moment. If you look at the Target 2 system, SEPA, instant payments, um, and I, if you compare that with the you know, regions of the world that are still writing checks, um, literally physical checks um, that get settled within days um, or even weeks, um, Europe has the infrastructure and the, the technology at the, um, at the central bank payments organization level um, that is second to none. The ECB is extremely um, thought leading um, in, terms of, um, in terms of conceptualization of how further digitalization of our currency system could look like. The European Central Bank is extremely pragmatic and uh, forward-leaning um, on, um, on introducing the European Payments Initiative. And so now I think it's exactly appropriate and correct um, that the Commission, um, at the political level, is also introducing a, uh, I would say, globally standard-setting um, set of rules. And I think, um, you know, MICA will be the acronym to memorize um, and to um, familiarize uh, oneself with 
if um, one wants to stay um, up to date about the global debate around stable coins and digitization of crypto assets and electronic payments and electronic um, um, digital ways to uh, to um, to move assets from um, A to B to use them as storage to use them as transaction tools as investing tools. Um, I think um, this is a huge opportunity um, for Europe to really get thought leadership and um, and um, and uh, set establish a set of rules that will um, on the one side create more efficiency by reducing barriers and that will allow companies in this sector to grow through scaling and through reducing barriers to create a true internal market. But on the other side, also act as global standard setters um, because anyone who wants to introduce a um, stable coin um, will have to adhere to one of the two paths foreseen in Mika. Um, and, um, and, you know, that will really, really set a standard and, um, and force everyone to think about if you want to access the European Union, um, you better um, take into account the rules that the European Union has set. And therefore, I think that will get uh, quite a lot of uh, global um, power. Um, also relating, I think very importantly, to the question of competitive policy, um, i.e. one of the very important um, components of the um, of the package um, proposed by the Commission, I think, is access to platforms um, and um, prohibition um, for owners of the platform to curtail access through, um, through closing their APIs. So I think it's extremely important that this opening of the system um, is something that will increase competitiveness, drive down prices, increase um, supply of innovative, um, of, of innovative products and lead to another, um, you know, series of, uh, of uh, creation of, um, of, uh, of companies in this sector in Europe. You raised, and I think very rightly, the fact that in payment systems at the moment, Europe is extremely competitive and extremely innovative compared, for example, to the US, still where checks, as you say, are still written out. But there's also this concern, uh, let's call it because it was one of the questions around strategic autonomy, around open strategic autonomy. The fact that in reality, a lot of these technology companies are still non-European. We look at largely to the West towards the US, but we could also look towards China with, with the growing market there of, of uh, technology companies. And, um, you know, Libra is one example. We've, you've mentioned already kind of com platforms, um, companies entering the market. How do you see this view of strategic autonomy? Because there's the concern, of course, that it might kind of shut Europe off or that we're trying to compete artificially, that a lot of public funding might be put available to come to the same level of innovation rather than investing in areas where we are in Europe leading. There's a lot of concern around this concept of strategic autonomy particularly in the context of financial services and even more so in the payment space. Maybe you might want to kind of set out the thinking there, how we kind yeah. of remain open in this area. Yeah, and I mean, and the, the strategic deficiency that we clearly have is, yes, we can pride ourselves in having a fantastic infrastructure, um, but, um, but the U.S. has been just much more efficient um, at uh, commercializing um, and, um, and finding efficient ways around their, um, you know, check writing infrastructure. So in that sense, um, it, it's great for Europe to have this fantastic infrastructure, but as long as the commercialization of the idea behind um, the digitization of payments um, and instant payments um, and um, all of the business models behind that um, are coming from U.S. corporates and not um, European ones, then job creation, value creation, and all of those things will come from the U.S. And I think um, the, key, the key thing that we will have to address um, in Europe um, is how we find ways to scale um, um, startup companies into bigger companies, right? I think uh, if you look at the numbers, it's not like Europeans don't um, act as founders of companies. The problem is once a company is founded, um, it, its scaling process um, um, is much more difficult in Europe than in the US. One of the reasons, of course, is a lot of these companies are um, active in service sectors. I would argue that the promise of the Lisbon Treaty um, of an internal market in the European Union has been much better fulfilled for, for physical products than for virtual services. So, um, you know, the completion of the internal market for digital services is something extremely important. It's top of mind for, for the commission. I think that's, you know, in terms of strategic autonomy, um, you know, the, the practical question, 
discussion, you can debate big picture a lot about strategic autonomy. Um, there was a time in Germany where a, a small company called StudiVZ um, was at the same level of subscriptions as Facebook. The big advantage that Facebook had is it could scale immediately across 50 states in the United States. Um, the problem of StudiVZ, it could not scale as quickly around 27 um, or at the time 28 member states um, in the EU. And the, you know, the 28 other market leading um, versions of Facebook in the European Union also had the same problem. So collectively, none of them was able to scale as quickly as Facebook could and Facebook won the prize, right? And um, any um, business model with, uh, with positive externalities of additional subscribers, of course, it's all about scale in platform economies. I think that's, uh, that's an obvious one. And if Europe um, constrains itself by 28 um, consumer protection, AML, KYC rules, um, now 27, um, the, the, this process of scaling will be, will be left behind um, and uh, our companies will remain smaller or not grow at all and, um, and, um, and, um, and, uh, uh, and disappear from the market. Um, the availability of funding. I mean, I talked about um, equity finance um, at the um, on the CMU topic. Um, if you read the history of Facebook, Amazon, Google, um, venture venture capital plays a huge role in all of those um, in all of those business models, um, and it uh, is tiny relative to the U.S. and Europe. So we massively have to grow VC in in Europe. Um, Germany just announced um, a two billion program immediately and a ten billion program to um, incentivize venture capital. Um, I announced um, that we're moving ahead with further legislation on um, VC motivation and incentivization um, just yesterday that uh, we're in the final stages of legislation on that, um, proposing legislation that will move forward on both incentivizing venture capital movement to Germany and um, employee uh, stock option um, programs to incentivize employees to also come here. So I think, you know, there's a lot going on. France has similar projects. Um, the EU has similar projects. So there's a lot going on, but we have to, we really have to execute on those, um, on those proposals um, because we have a lot of catching up to do. Thank you. We, we just hosted an event earlier this week with a number of entrepreneurs on how to scale up in Europe and what the barriers are which also includes tax, for example, or uncertainty around tax yep. legislation. But it's interesting yep. you say that. One very last question, so I'm conscious of time. It won't surprise you. We haven't mentioned the B word yet, Brexit. Uh, I know you can't comment on the negotiations. I know you're not close enough to the negotiations, maybe even. But um, nonetheless, I will ask the question because I know you're a perpetual optimist. Uh, how, what, what's your vision for the future? Let's put it like that. What's your vision for the future of the EU-UK relationship? Well, I think no matter what comes, what comes up, of course, there's so much uh, depth and intensity of relationship between European um, countries and the UK that, uh, you know, the, this will not degenerate into animosity. I'm absolutely convinced about that. Um, you know, German corporates, for all I can tell, rely massively on access to wholesale financing um, 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 offers from the city of London. Um, so in that sense, I think, um, you know, the, we will have to maintain uh, pragmatism no matter what happens. And I'm convinced that that will um, be the result. But um, of course, at the moment, uh, we are deeply concerned by the lack of progress in the negotiations. And uh, that is something that, um, that uh, for a very large part of the foreseeable future, if it goes wrong, um, would be a massive detriment to um, integration steps. So I think... Um, I think that uh, that is uh, that is something that uh, hopefully can still be resolved, and um, you know, hope for the best, plan for the worst is a good maxim there. Um, but uh, but obviously, as you say, um, you know, we can't comment in, in any way, shape, or form on the progress of the negotiations at this stage. No, thank you very much. With that, I, I think I should relieve you, uh, but I would like to thank you very very much for spending this time with us. I wish you all the best for the remainder of the German presidency and beyond. And uh, hopefully see you sometime soon again. I know you've been supporting us repeatedly and a big thank you for that. And uh, thanks from the whole audience, which can only kind of virtually thank you. Uh, but with that, I wish you a very good Friday and a good weekend when you get a chance to get to it. And a big thank you again. Thanks, your Kukas. Thank you.